Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, I'm Robert Lawrence. I'm a professor of international trade and investment here at the Kennedy School. And uh, we're really delighted today uh, to have uh, Peter Sutherland here to talk to us. Uh, Mr. Sutherland is currently the chairman and managing director of Goldman Sachs International, uh, but he has had an incredibly uh, successful and a uh, career, having held a, a large number of different positions. And if I were to recite them, well, it would probably take this, this entire afternoon. But particularly worthy of mention is the fact that he was the youngest attorney general uh, in Ireland. He then served on the European Commission as the commissioner for competition policy. And then, for our purposes, most relevant, was the fact that he uh, was the uh, uh, actually the first director general of the WTO. Uh, indeed, he uh, served at, uh, uh, as the director general bringing in the Uruguay round successfully in the mid-90s. So as a person positioned to give us perspective on firstly what it's like to be the director general of the WTO, what kind of challenges such a position, a person in that position faces, I think he's uniquely qualified. And in addition, as someone who can give us his insights uh, on the current state of play in the global trading system, uh, both with respect to the uh, multilateral system and with respect to, to regionalism. Indeed, he's chosen as his title, Global Trade Policy and the Rush to Bilateralism. So with that, uh, it's really uh, a delight for me to call on uh, Mr. Sutherland. He'll talk to us maybe for 30, 35 minutes, and then what we're looking forward to is a lot of engagement and interaction. Mr. Sutherland. Well, first of all, let me say that I hate talking to experts, and I have one sitting here beside me. So I'm, I'm denying him the right to ask any questions. <laughs> Secondly, Irish people don't speak for half an hour. They usually speak for an hour to two hours. What they say and whether they fill that time up with their comments is a question for some debate. But it's a, it's a pleasure to talk to you. And I thought that I would start by placing in context a very personal history of engagement with this issue of trade and multilateral trade in particular. When I went to the Commission in 1989, Europe was at a stage of, which was generally described as eurosclerosis. Oops, sorry, can I pass the board? Sure. Uh, and <coughs> At that time, um, rather like today, it was facing a crisis. The way that the crisis was dealt with under the leadership of Jacques Delors was by the program, the 1992 program, which was to complete the internal market and create free movement of goods, persons, capital, and services. And that four-year period that I was in the Commission was the important <coughs> period in that maneuver, a maneuver to create a more integrated Europe and an economic dynamic as a result. That was a successful project. It was a project whose time had come. And it combined at a moment of time with a number of, of other events which were transformative in terms of the world in which we live. Most importantly, it was the collapse of the Iron Curtain in 1989 and 1990. So we had, for the first time, the beginnings of a process which could be described as globalization. There was an acceptance around the world, particularly in the former communist states, that the free market economy model was the only model that basically worked. Uniquely, therefore, at a moment in time, we had the potential to see a single global economic community. The example that was provided by the European Union, which was unique because it was supranational, not merely intergovernmental, provided a catalyst for some of this change and demonstrated an example 
for what could be done. It was a catalyst for change because it was one of the factors that drove the admittedly inevitable collapse of the <clears throat> former Warsaw Pact countries. Suddenly, the graphic difference between what was happening in Western Europe and Eastern Europe in terms of economic model and development was staringly obvious, starkly obvious. And it was part of, and it was at least an element in the collapse of the Iron Curtain. At the same time, in China, there was a growing realization that the command economy wasn't working. And I remember seeing subsequently in the WTO the initial memorandum that came from China by way of application to join GATT. And that initial application was very blunt and very clear. It said starkly again that the economic model of the communist system in China wasn't working and couldn't work. And the intention was to become part of the global economic community and therefore to apply the disciplines which had been developed since the end of the Second World War through the trading system which had been developed by GATT. So at that period, the beginning of the 90s, <clears throat> we had a conjuncture of events that left us with the potential for the transformation of the world in which we live. Speaking personally as an Irishman, I had always believed in integration in Europe as being part and parcel of the destiny which my little country required to develop in the world in which we lived. But having served in the European Commission, I became more, much more developed in my attitude towards European integration, which I saw as a noble concept, a concept which involved sharing of sovereignty in a way which was very fundamental. So at the end of my time in the Commission, um, I had an interest in the global implications of the same type of process and served on a committee formed by the then New Zealand Prime Minister Mike Moore, who was later to be my successor in, in, in the WTO, on looking at how we could develop the global trading system. If I could look back for a moment at its history, in the inspired period of institution building after the Second World War, people like Dean Acheson, largely led by the United States, a number of moves were made to create structures which would help to avoid calamitous wars like those which had just taken place. So the European integration process was driven by the Second World War, bringing together France and Germany, and in particular bringing Germany into a, into a role again in Europe. At the same time, the US was working on the formation of a new structure for the global economy, which would also foster, in a less obvious way, the interdependence, which would help to avoid the same sort of catastrophic issues and difficulties which had existed before to avoid the 1920s and 30s saga of uh, distress uh, as a result of the Wall Street collapse and the protectionism uh, that was obvious at those times and which would provide a structure for the future. And again, going back to that early stage, the World, uh, at least the World Bank and the IMF were created the UN became a different type of reality to the League of Nations, and an attempt was made to create an international trade organization. And ultimately, it foundered also here in the United States on concerns of interference with national sovereignty. So this was the backdrop. What was created instead was a secretariat called GATT, 
the General Agreement of Trade at Paris, which is uh, a uniquely boring title for what to many people seem to be a uniquely boring organization. <laughs> but that uniquely boring organization uh, was to develop over a series of trade rounds, the most important of which were the Kennedy, Kennedy and Tokyo rounds, a liberalization of world trade that transformed the Western world before the events which I've described a moment ago, the collapse of the Iron Curtain. And how did it transform the world? It transformed the world by a multilateral system that was based around rather simple principles. Most importantly, what's called the most favored nation principle which is non-discrimination. A country acquires access to a market, others also acquire the same access. Very simple, logical, and avoiding the setting up of bilateral relationships which exclude others from them. And the second fundamental principle was called national treatment, that once you had access to a market, you would be treated in the same way as the nationals of the country in question. And those rounds were driven by the leadership of the United States. The United States, to my mind, was the core element in the development of free trade, competition, and therefore flowing from it, innovation and greater prosperity, and opportunity indeed for the more disadvantaged countries in the world community to some extent. That process was the process which I was invited into uh, in the early 90s. When I left the commission, I received a phone call. I went to uh, Brussels to meet Mickey Cantor, who was the US trade representative at the time. We went to a rather indifferent uh, French restaurant, which I remember well. I'd never met Mickey Cantor before, and I didn't really know what I was going over for. I was chairman of a bank, which in Ireland at least is not one something that one uh, claims as, a, as an accolade at the moment. <laughs> but I was reasonably content in my native land, and uh, I sat down opposite Mickey Cantor, and he said, uh, what do you know about the GATT? And I said, not a lot, a little. But he said, do you know anything about trade policy? And I said, very little, indeed. Well, he said, I know nothing about it either, but I'm the US <laughs> trade representative. <laughs> <laughs> he said, the Uruguay round, he said, has been going on for the last seven years. It's going nowhere. It really is important. And I know that tomorrow you are seeing Leon Britton, who was then the Trade Commissioner for the EU, and he and I want to propose to you that you become Secretary General of GATT. And I said uh, something to the effect, do you think I'm insane? <laughs> and he, he said, I really think you should do this. And I said, why should I have any confidence that this is going to work? And I remember him saying, uh, distinctly, I remember him saying, look into my eyes, which is something I normally only do to my wife. In the <laughs> he said, look into my eyes, I'm going to tell you something. He said, you don't go down in history for failing to make an agreement. I know that, he said. President Clinton knows that. And you should know that. And therefore, you can take it from me that we want to deliver. And I must say, I was profoundly impressed by it. I was impressed by what he said and by his resolution. He was clearly intent on getting the Uruguay round done. And President Clinton was clearly intent on getting the Uruguay round done. I then went back to Dublin. I remember speaking to one, one of the ministers at the time and said to him that I was thinking of becoming Secretary General of the GATT, and he said, what's that? Uh, which, which dampened a little, a, little bit of, a little bit of my ardor. But I went back, I went back, I went back to Geneva and became Secretary General of what was 
a secretariat. It was very different from the institution from which I came, the European Commission. The European Commission is a supranational body. As competition commissioner, for an example, I could propose to the Commission that we preclude a government from spending its own tax revenue and supporting its industry. State subsidies were under control, in other words, in a way which was supranational. Supranational because they could, that decision could be enforced in national courts against the government where the national court resided. And that is the crucial difference between the uh, European Union and something like the GATT. But the Commission had the power to do this, and it had the exclusive power to propose legislation. The GATT Secretariat was literally a secretariat. It was at the service and under the direction of the member states. It had no independent power of initiative, whilst it had economists and it had great capacities to propose ideas. It had no power of initiative, which was exclusive to it. And I must say, I was worried about this, because it seemed to me that one was going into a position where the real power of influence over what was to happen was so extremely limited that it would be very difficult to make a difference. There was, however, one other vehicle at that, that time, which was called the Trade Negotiation Committee, which is where all the discussions took place. And I asked whether I could become chairman of the Trade Negotiations Committee, normally chaired by a member state, rather than uh, simply the Secretary General of the, of the of the GATT, and I was given that uh, power, uh, which probably was greatly regretted subsequently by a number of member states as I fixed the agendas, fixed the minutes, and fixed the results of various <laughs> members, member state discussions during the preceding uh, uh, couple of years when we tried to bring these negotiations to a conclusion. And they were extremely difficult. They were extremely difficult because, for one thing, in this country, we were doing exactly what the United States had rejected in the late 40s. We were creating a World Trade Organization, which was a duplicate of the ITO, which had been rejected by the United States on the grounds that it was an interference with sovereignty. And uh, President Clinton, when we we brought the negotiations through a, a period of great difficulty to almost to a conclusion. And there was a serious concern here that it would not be possible to have it passed by Congress. NAFTA had just taken place, which was again, in my view, a great triumph for President Clinton. Uh, Clinton was determined to put through the, what was then a successful culmination of negotiations existence of the WTO and was about to come, it was about to come into existence, assuming that the US ratified. And at that time, uh, I flew over here and I remember meeting Newt Gingrich, who was um, at that time um, speaker and leading the Republicans. And he said, uh, I, I remember rushing into a room uh, to, to meet, and he said, I've got two questions. He said, what about sovereignty? What about US sovereignty? That's my problem. And I drew the distinction between the European situation where a national court could be invoked as a result of a breach by the state of the obligations under its treaty with the GATT, or WTO as it would become, where it would be impossible to invoke national courts to enforce the agreements that the United States had entered into. And cutting the long story short, it was agreed by Congress and the Republicans supported the creation of an institution which was, in my view, one of the great advances, if not the greatest advance, in multilateral uh, diplomacy 
since the Second World War. And it accommodated, during the years that were to follow, the integration of China into the world economy. Anybody from China would testify to the fact that during the period coming up to accession, uh, the Chinese, the entire sell selling of the obligations that would be imposed was placed on obligations imposed by the WTO membership. It allowed for the transformation and integration of China into the global economy without what would otherwise have been the appalling difficulties of accommodating a power that could be seen, even in those days, as a potential challenger to the almighty US economy in, the, in, in world terms. And it was an act of uh, supreme statesmanship, in my view, that the United States recognizing that this body would accommodate uh, China and ultimately, as it transpired recently, Russia, <clears throat> that this body should be something which was largely brought into existence as a result of that leadership which I've referred to. I make that point because what I'm coming to is the, con is the conclusion which I've reached that the United States is now a destructive element in the multilateral system of trade in a way which is leading one to grave concerns about where the world is going and the disputes and difficulties that it is likely to give rise to. First of all, let me say that the, that the um, WTO, by becoming an organization, became positively different from the GATT Secretariat which preceded it. In particular, and most importantly, it created a dispute settlement mechanism. Before the WTO existed, if there was a trade dispute between two countries, the trade disputes, as we know over history, have given rise to wars. If there was such a dispute, the dispute would be submitted to a panel, the panel would reach a conclusion, and if either of the parties, a wronging party, for example, dis disputed the uh, conclusion of the panel, they could veto it. The dispute settlement mechanism which came into existence with the creation of the WTO was an adjudication system that couldn't be vetoed and was conducted independently rather than having a court made up of a national of the country concerned, a national of the other country concerned, and a third party. So we had suddenly a huge, a huge change. And everybody wanted to be part of it. I think there are 153 members today. Virtually all viable states in the world are members of it. I remember in my time they're going to visit Mr. Yeltsin, um, who was unsteady on his feet, I should say, at 10 o'clock in the morning when I met him. <laughs> but even allowing for that uh, incapacity, he was able to articulate uh, a concern that Russia should be part of a global system, which was obviously a global system which was independent of the power of individual states to frustrate its activities. And that was a change of some importance for Russia also in attitudes. I must say subsequently I had discussions after I'd left with Mr. Putin, who was less convinced it appeared for a time about the need for China, to, for Russia to be part of the WTO system, but ultimately, but ultimately became part of it. And I think it was inevitable that that should be the case. If the multilateral system was based upon this principle of most favored nation, non-discrimination, um, how? Could you have and accommodate regional agreements which did discriminate? The most obvious and profound example of which was the European Union itself. 
but others were to follow. NAFTA, Mercosur, agreements of a regional dimension which allowed for certain advantages to be given to those who were within the group and excluding those who were outside it. Well, regional free trade agreements in many ways are conducive to world trade. They succeed in breaking down the barriers first, as a result of which it becomes possible to multilateralize the obligations which have been undertaken. Uh, for an example, the Uruguay round could never have been concluded, and there could never have been a WTO, in my view, if each of the European states were negotiating separately on joining and creating the organization. France, for one, would have been totally opposed to the liberalization, albeit inadequate liberalization, that took place of agriculture. It would have been blocked. And um, another anecdote at that time, before the round concluded, I visited Chancellor Cole because we were having such difficulty with the French uh, Prime Minister Balladur at the time. And uh, I remember saying to uh, Mr. Cole, can you, can you put some pressure on France to come into line and therefore to have the European situation correct in regard to uh, the creation of the WTO? He pointed to a portrait on the wall of Mr. Adenauer. And he said, I went into uh, politics for three reasons. He said, unification of uh, Germany, which had been achieved, unification, he said, of Europe based on the Franco-German alliance. I never want to experience again what I have seen in my family has suffered in the Second World War. And thirdly, he said, free trade, particularly with the United States. He said, I, you can't expect me, nonetheless, to publicly criticize France and thereby to jeopardize, jeopardize the second of those objectives for the purpose of bringing them into, into being the third. But I will help privately, and he did, and help to bring about the uh, integration of uh, the German, of the, of the European position to allow the WTO to be created. But as I said, the accommodation of uh, regional agreements and interregional agreements has been one of the most vexed issues in terms of making the whole system work. But basically, if an agreement between two states encompasses all types of trade, and the agreement liberalizes that trade, that type of customs union can be compatible, <coughs> although it has rarely been properly tested with the WTO rules. What, however, has become extremely worrying is the fact that for the last period of years, even after the demonstrable success of the GATT system and the WTO itself, itself in bringing about globalization without conflict, integrating China into the global economy, and many others besides, that we now seem to be in a situation where there is an absence of leadership, notably in the United States, in regard to where we go next. And that's what I want to talk about now. The Doha round, which is the latest in this long series of rounds, uh, which have brought us to where we are with a largely integrated global economy. The Doha round appears now to have failed. It has failed because a negotiation which has gone on for years and which was calculated and intended in particular to help the poorest countries in the world. Initially, it was to be called the development although I never, I never agreed with that. I never agreed with the, the whole idea of, of, of it being a development round or that there should be a focus, an exclusive focus on, on developing countries' interests because I knew that even if that was morally correct in certain, some circumstances, it wasn't delivering. The whole rationale for negotiation and trade is that there has to be a balance on both sides and there has to be an advantage on both sides. But the negotiations have gone on for years, and they've actually delivered an enormous amount of potential good. A great deal of the agreement 
uh, is in place. But there has been a lack of leadership to bring the Doha round over the line, so to speak. The multilateral system has arguably brought a billion and a half people out of poverty around the world. There are parts of the world that haven't gained as a result of it, Sub-Saharan Africa being the most obvious example. Asia, on the other hand, has gained by it. The parts of the world that have not gained by it, and have not gained by globalization, are parts of the world who didn't have the capacity to take advantage of the equality of opportunity that was sought to be provided by the multilateral trading system. And that's why Sub-Saharan Africa has not really benefited to a great degree by the freeing up of trade. That combined with some of the continuing restrictions on agriculture in uh, Europe and the United States and indeed on textiles. But the argument for a multilateral trading system and the conclusion of a further round of liberalization that would have brought enormous benefits to the world seem to be over to me to be overwhelming. And yet it didn't happen. And the last two years have been a vital period in that failure. Why didn't it happen? It didn't happen because first of all there has been a failure to take on some of the lobbies that argue against globalization in principle. Their argumentation, to my mind, cannot, cannot possibly be an accurate reflection of the realities of the advantages <coughs> of opening borders and opening opportunities. Secondly, it is the result of the fact that politicians are concerned by the focused lobbies of those who don't want trade liberalization. It could be an industry sector, could be the steel sector, could be the textile sector, could be the agricultural sector. And it is just not a popular issue. It is not popular to argue for trade liberalization. The general good in reduced costs, in reduced prices, and general benefit to society is outweighed in the political mind by the disadvantage of the extensive lobbying power of those who oppose. President Obama has not, been, has not led in the area of multilateral trade negotiations. In his first uh, election, um, the subject was only mentioned in the context of NAFTA, and then in the context of renegotiating part of NAFTA. So far from being positive, it was rather negative. The other side, the Republican side, hasn't been any better. There has been a failure here, possibly because of concerns of lost jobs and rising unemployment, to see and present the advantages of open trade rather than the opposite. That's one side of the equation. The other equally fallible and culpable reason for the failure of the current round has been the attitude of some of the developing countries, or countries that now define themselves as developing. China, far from leading, <coughs> has been slow to make some of the concessions that were necessary to bring the United States and some of the developed countries to the table in an effective way. Its responsibility in terms of the divisions which one can foresee in the future and the difficulty in resolving those without a fair adjudication if the WTO has lost credibility as a result of all of this is very hard to understand. India, too, has always had a certain ambivalence about the WTO and the development of the WTO and multilateralism. And that, combined with Brazil, has provided a number of different points of difficulty in bringing 
the negotiations, which, as I've said, have already on the table very substantial advantages. Let me, let me give you an example of some of these. Um, first of all, we have a situation in regard, to, in regard to the least developed countries in the world who um, uh, are and could be provided quota-free and tariff-free access to all of the developed markets in the world. That would have a very substantial uh, effect on the least developed countries in the world. It would increase, according to most summaries, their exports, for an example, by 44%. This could transform poverty in significant parts of the world. Um, the amount that uh, the uh, Europeans had agreed, but may not now implement, in terms of agricultural reduction of agricultural support, again a matter of great importance to the rest of the world, is again very considerable. Uh, the uh, access that it would provide to Latin America in terms of export of uh, the export of, 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 of cattle, for example, is very considerable. There are huge advantages which are there, but which are not going to be provided. Instead of which, we are facing now a rash of bilateral negotiations. Multilateralism has been put to one side, and instead, in its place, we have both Europe and the United States, and China also, entering into bilateral agreements. Bilateral trade agreements with different terms, different obligations, and no question of the non-discrimination clause existing. This is a reversion to a world that many of us had thought was left behind us. It is extremely potentially dangerous. And the movement towards bilateralism is evident everywhere. It's even now being discussed in terms of interregional bilateralism. We hear a great deal of talk here about a trans-Pacific free trade area. We even hear that old canal of a transatlantic free trade area being raised again. Well, let's take both of those. I don't think either will happen. I don't believe that either should happen. And it would divide the rich and the poor in the world in a way which would be very destructive. Apart from that, there have been a whole lot of bilateral treaties executed and, and created all over the world. Again, this creates an attack on multilateralism and ultimately is very much to the disadvantage of the smaller countries in the world. To their disadvantage because the negotiating strength of the two parties are gross, grossly disproportionate. So multilateralism, I think, is facing a time of real crisis. And it's, 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 it's facing crisis because of an absence of leadership. And that absence of leadership, as I've said, is spread through all parts of the world, but particularly in the major trading entities. The United States, to a lesser extent for once, the Europeans. I don't say that as a European, but the Europeans had made a significant move in agriculture, which was, I think, very considerable. But the United States, China, India, and Brazil collectively and individually have not done what they should have done to bring the negotiations to a conclusion, and I think that they are now dead. The subject appears to be almost irrelevant in Washington. If you speak about trade in Washington, or even perhaps even now in Brussels, nobody wants to know. And yet, what is potentially being sacrificed here is a means to a more effectively interdependent world. And that failure will be a failure which history will mark as being an extremely important one. And the moment of light that was obvious to us during those years of the 90s, following the creation of the single market, is now transformed to a Europe which is in difficulties, an entirely unrelated issue 
the debt crisis to a divided trading world where the proliferation of bilateral agreements threatens, does not assist ultimately, in my view, the uh, multilateral system, where the diversion of effort and attention by governments is often politically motivated to do specific deals with specific company, countries. I mean, one of the, some of the earliest negotiations here were with Bahrain and Oman, for God's sake, hardly huge economic entities. And yet, this is taking the place of the type of consideration for a global system, fostering globalization, fostering equity, and fostering the type of interdependence that the world needs to have a secure and safe future. So my conclusion is that the Europe, the, the world trading system, has been left with a much worse position today than the position which existed in the 90s. And there is no sign whatsoever that there is any impulse to move in the opposite direction. I think it was a French philosopher who once made the comment that to be a prophet it is necessary to be a pessimist. I, I had never believed that before, but on this particular subject, I must say I am deeply concerned, deeply worried that we're drifting with scarcely a murmur of dissent to a catastrophic result, which will be the paralysis of the WTO left hanging out with a trade negotiation system and a dispute resolution system, which has suffered a serious blow to its own credibility as a result of the failure of leadership of the major powers in the world today. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, Mr. Sutherland. Thank you for the uh, wonderful speech. I just had a question. Uh, you talked about uh, the trade liberalization, uh, mostly in terms of goods. And you said they've come to a, uh, almost a stall. They haven't stalled. Is there maybe an opportunity now uh, for us to move to labor uh, negotiations instead of just goods in, in the sense? You mean free movement of people? Yes, indeed. <coughs> the, the simple answer to that is that um, I currently play some role in that. I'm the special representative of the Secretary General of the UN for Migration. And I can tell you that there is no chance whatsoever that anybody is going to agree to introduce into the trade negotiations, <coughs> although it could be introduced, and arguably should be introduced, substantial movement and reg in regard to treaty obligations for free movement of people. This is probably the most toxic subject of all. Uh, it's regrettable that that's the case, but uh, I'm afraid that there's going to be no progress here. Uh, Governments are intensely sensitive about national sovereignty and control of migration, and they're not going to agree to multilateralize it. Somebody else? You mentioned the, the depth of the, the Uruguay round. Um, what do you think it will take to resurrect the Uruguay round? And what kind of leadership do you think it will take to? Um, I don't. I don't believe that the Uruguay, that the the Doha round, which I assume you're really talking about. I don't believe that the Doha round can be resurrected in the foreseeable future in its entirety. It may be possible to conclude a Doha light, which would be uh, include a number of areas which have been substantially concluded. But even that, I think, is very unlikely, because you need all of the trade-offs on the various areas to conclude any trade negotiation. And you cannot take one aspect of it on its own without somebody feeling that take trade facilitation, like improving customs and movement of goods and so on. Uh, it, 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 some people say, well, we've agreed all of that. Can't we do that? And that will be as valuable in some respects as tariff reductions. Uh, I contemplated tariff reductions. Well, that may be true, but already India is saying 
in regard to that. Well, hang on for a minute. We're not happy with that. We need, we need, um, uh, we need something on the other side. So if that doesn't work. I think we're probably going to move into more plurilateral agreements, which will be less desirable. Um, but maybe they'll have an open architecture, by which I mean you take a particular subject, you say we're going to liberalize this. Anybody who wants to jump on the bandwagon can do so. Others can stay out, but they can join if they wish in the future. And therefore, to some extent, you keep the non-discrimination element alive. I think that that's the most probable outcome. At the moment, there isn't an appetite for including a trade route. And um, the leadership is absent. At the end of the day, as I said at the very beginning, no trade movement can be expected without the leadership of the United States. So we're back to square one. Whether the next administration will, looking at looming trade disputes, for example, we see it today in, 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 in the telecom sector in your newspapers, Chinese challenge the telecom sector and how it's going to be dealt with and the reaction here and one can readily see the trade disputes of a very serious nature developing, and that in turn can give rise to protectionist pressures, which to date, I must say, have been generally resisted, even though the WTO has been going through this period of, of difficulty. Yeah. No, you don't. My name is Sarah Dillon, and I actually taught trade law at I thought you were a woman of great talent. I During mean, the 1990s, so I'm well aware of what a wonderful ambassador you've been for global trade. Uh, my question, though, is has to do with whether you're taking your vision of the EU, and the EU deserves great praise, and sort of extrapolating from that and praising the global trade system in a way that it doesn't really deserve. Particularly, can you really say that American labor, ordinary people, not elite trade professors, not graduate students at Harvard, but could you go into a union hall and say that American workers have benefited from the WTO in a way that should justify going further with negotiating rounds? I, there's the peace dimension of trade, and there's the prosperity dimension, but I think you're way overemphasizing this glorious post-war vision of the peace side, and maybe ignoring the fact that American workers are very queasy about the effect on their lives of more and more global trade. I don't think they understand the trade agreements, but they know that something is wrong there. Well, I mean, first of all, let me say that that's a very treacherous question from a UCD girl. But um, <laughs> having, said, having said that, let me try to demolish it. Um, uh, it's, it's, I think, I. Of course, there are victims of trade liberalization. Of course, it is true to say that there are factory workers who will suffer as a result of lower cost imports coming from other economies in the world. And there have been, as you know, <coughs> numerous books about the overall benefit and, uh, and a disadvantage of free trade. And I think the vast bulk of them come to the conclusion the overall advantages far outweigh the disadvantages. And whilst there are and will be those who will suffer as a result of opening competition, the advantages to the consumer have to be also taken into account and also the advantage of having competition to create efficiency. It's back to the old argument about Japanese cars, which we had 20 years ago in this country. We shouldn't allow Japanese cars in. We all remember that. How long did that logically exist? It was fought down, thank God, because if you had that argument, you end up in a situation where your car industry becomes utterly ineffective, ineffectual and unable to compete. So I still think that the arguments for free trade are far outweigh those uh, on the other side. Uh, the U.S. has a smaller dependence on trade than Europe, so there's more argument on the issue here. And one can't, I can't prove inclusively that the balance is one way or the other, but I think that the overall writing on the subject does seem to suggest that it's better to have free trade than the opposite. Thank you.
And that's really the question that you're asking, it seems to me. You can't have, you can't half have it. You're either in favour of free trade or you're not. And I, I am. Yeah? Another one of the objections to uh, free trade or uh, globalization, at least as it's practiced uh, through the WTO, is that it's designed to privatize public spaces. Now, a lot of the Latin American countries are starting to fight back against that uh, because they feel that it's uh, taking over their water, taking over the land, and many other aspects that they're losing uh, popular local control over. Uh, so you still haven't re really addressed the, the local democratic uh, issues yet. The WTO is seen as a very shadowy, unaccountable, non-transparent organization uh, in many people's minds. Uh, it's uh, robbing them of their resources rather than uh, helping them better use them for their own benefit. Well, <clears throat> to be honest with you, and I don't mean this in a negative way of your question, I don't understand the question. How is the WTO taking natural resources or opening up natural resources? By, by breaking down environmental and social barriers the, country, the countries have erected from large corporations going in there and assuming control of them. Well, I, I, I don't see the power that exists in the WTO to do what you described. That's a matter for national governments to protect their environment. It is not environmentally unfriendly to have opportunities to trade out of a country with another country, which is all what the WTO is about. So I, I don't actually see the argument here. Well, isn't one of the central tenets of the WTO to not allow non-commercial values to determine trade policy, to uh, eliminate those and sweep them away? No, I don't believe that it is. Well, I believe that the, 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 the objective is solely to liberalize trade, no more and no less. And I think that generally is good for everybody. But maybe I'm missing a point. I don't mean to be rude to you. Yeah, I think that uh, Hirok Sengupta, the gentleman, is right in that the non-tariff barriers like environmental issues and child labor issues, those are not covered as far as I understand on the WTO and you cannot raise those as a uh, real application for resolving the WTOs. Another major thing that WTO is not addressing is the manipulation of the exchange rate, you know, where the countries are at the mercy of manipulators of, uh, of the exchange rates uh, and various other non tariff barriers. So what has happened is that last, from 1991, the developed countries have experienced not so much of a great experience in China. You know, if you have seen the eagerness of U.S. administration to go for a is not there because nobody could have predicted the appearance of a 500-pound gorilla into the world trade system, which is China. And I'm sorry, really, could, could we please have your question? Yeah, I think because what is the effect of it. China? Emergence of China into the taste, bitter taste of the developed countries in further progressing uh, trade negotiation. What did that Well. Let me first of all deal with the first part of your question. I don't believe that the trade system, the WTO system, is the place to deal with issues of environment or child labor. It will be used as a mechanism by the powerful countries of the world for protectionism. And I think that the demand for the fair treatment of, in global terms, of, for example, issue of child labor has to be developed as it is being developed in a different way by the publication and publishing of the realities of companies who abuse uh, in, in their own environment children who work for them and so on we've seen how they can be destroyed in commercially and that's the way it should be done for the WTO to try to adjudicate on child labor issues I think doesn't make sense I think also with the environmental issue, I think that the environmental issue, uh, introducing it into trade, as was attempted, for an example, in India, in the context of the uh, creation of the WTO itself at the conclusion of the Uruguay Round, was actually, and it's too complicated, you may understand why, it was actually used by another lobby, the pharmaceutical lobby, to deal with its concerns about intellectual property rights. And it, it proves the point that I'm making, 
that these issues are actually used as protectionist vehicles to stop trade taking place. The China issue, I think that the overwhelming consequence of bringing China into the global trading system has been beneficial. It's been beneficial in terms of providing a dynamic for global growth, which is sadly missing elsewhere. It has admittedly created challenges for those who can't compete. But that, again, comes back to the argument about whether competition is good or bad overall for economic prosperity. I think it's good. I can't say that it doesn't pose problems when you've cheap uh, Chinese exports going to country A, B, C, or D. But I do say that the overall balance of advantage by having China in, as long as China plays by the rules, <coughs> protects intellectual property and uh, does not subsidize or create distortions in its industrial fabric, I still think the overall advantage of having them in a global system is far greater than the disadvantage uh, that you've described. Although I can see that there's a point in what you mean. Well, I, I, sorry, sorry, we can't have dialogues. I'm sorry. A good question, but uh, we need to move okay. to other people. Yes. Hi, Mr. Sutherland. Um, you mentioned at the end of your talk that uh, the danger that regionalism is playing correctly to the multilateral talks. However, there's also been significant scholarship that argued that it's more of a cycle that shifts between bilateralism and regionalism. And then finally, when the powerful countries have achieved what they wanted, it becomes a new standard, for example, in IP law. So coming to my question, um, <laughs> Do you think that, do you really think that this is all breaking down, or is this all part of a greater cycle, and could you speak a little bit more to that effect? Well, I, I'm not sure that there is evidence of cycles in something which is really new, which is an advanced multilateral system. So we haven't had a cycle of that kind before. I think that bilateralism <clears throat> is becoming so endemic in the trade negotiations profiles of many of the major powers, that it is a direct attract, attack on, on multilateralism. There is no attempt being made to multilateralize the bilateral agreements and therefore to open up the advantages on a non-discriminatory basis. And in fact, there's more and more talk of expanding the bilateralism, as I said, to things like a transatlantic free trade area, which I completely oppose. Just to take that as an example, which is different, I admit, it would be a huge proportion of world trade would be behind the barrier, so to speak, of a transatlantic treaty or agreement, which would obviously discriminate against the rest of the world. I think that that's divisive and undesirable as a mechanism for the future of development of trade generally. Uh, and, and as I've also said, the bilateral negotiations between the US, for example, and tiny countries, relatively tiny countries, which are conducted for political reasons, often rather than trade reasons, can themselves create distortions. Because advantages are being given or taken from country X for reasons which are not related to trade and which create a, uh, a diversion of trade from some other, some other country. And I, 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 I'm, I'm therefore just of the view that we may not be dealing with a cycle, we may be dealing with a paradigm shift to a new type of order, which goes back to the sort of bilateralism which has caused so many conflicts in the past. I'm a researcher at the Kennedy School, and I was based in Geneva for some years. So the talk in Geneva is not if the, if the Doha can be saved, but if WTO can be saved from Doha. Right? Uh, and there's a lot of ideas floating around on WTO reform. Some point to the single undertaking, that's the problem. Uh, some point to the consensus rule. Do you think that, that, that this, this, this pause in the negotiations should uh, be an opportunity to, to, to address the issue of WTO reform as an institution, or that is, that is a scapegoat that, that is looked at? And then just taking advantage of your hat as private sector, uh, private sector plays a role in Uruguay around to push it. That it could bet. Where is the private sector in, in, in this case? Uh, on, on the, on the, on the <coughs> you're, you're quite right to take the latter part of, of your question. The private sector is absent on parade. 
Um, but I suppose after uh, a cumulative period between the Uruguay round and the Doha round of about 15 years of negotiation, they've had it in terms of impetus and they in turn are also focusing on bilaterals uh, because they feel that there's no political will to proceed with the multilateral route, so they are absent. And the only people who are present are the negative lobbies, and therefore that is uh, vitally, I, I think, a, a destructive quality in the current debate. With regard to what can be done, I think a lot can be done in reform of the WTO itself and the organization. <clears throat> in fact, I think something should be done to give more power to what is still essentially a secretariat to take initiatives and to pursue initiatives to uh, bring negotiations to conclusions. I think it could be argued that the WTO has been less proactive in leadership than it might be, and that perhaps reforms should look at that. It should have, as an institution, independent institution, greater powers to put on the table solutions and to force negotiation around those solutions rather than to step back from them. Yes? The history of the GATT has some recurring themes, all of which you touched upon. Things like the challenge of protectionism, the rise of regionalism and bilateral agreements, the absence of American leadership, and a chronic crisis, alleged crisis for multilateralism that was voiced in 1947, 48, and throughout until the WTO was, or came into being at the end of the Uruguay round. So why is it now that these factors have reached a stage of a particular crisis? Why is the crisis more acute? Now, it was before, and why is the balance tipped? I think the balance has tipped because uh, the challenge of China and India and Brazil has for the first time become apparent to the OECD countries. Before, trade negotiations may have been seen as a mechanism for opening, prizing open, developing country markets without having to face the challenge that those developing country markets might themselves penetrate your own market. And I think that really it is the accommodation of China into the global trading system. And India, although it was a member for a very long period of time, was an import substitute economy for so long that it simply didn't play a role in opening trade. And now, suddenly, all of these powers present a challenge. And I think that that is the fundamental reason for a back off by the developed economies from a, a, a real engagement in the process of multilateral trade. Anyone else? Yes. Thank you very much for your vivid uh, future uh, description of the uh, successful conclusion of Robert Law. But in addition to uh, American leadership and your leadership, uh, the trade off between uh, the two developed countries and developing groups is very important, and if you for, do not foresee any victorious uh, uh, trade-off for the time being and in the near future, do you foresee any disaster? You know, because sometimes initiative is taken in time of disaster. Do you foresee any disastrous consequence that might uh, force both group to back down a bit from their current position? Where, might I ask where you're from? Oh, from Taiwan, sorry. I'm oh, are you Taiwan? No, no. I, wa I, wa I wasn't sure because I, I thought for a moment that you might have been from Japan, and I wanted to say that I also blame Japan for this. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't want, I didn't want anyway. Japan, in fact, would be, I, would, I emphasize that again. They have been absent on parade in a big way in this whole thing. Um, uh, do, do I see a disaster coming? Um, and could a disaster bring things forward? I don't see a disaster. I mean, I, I can't present this as being an apocalyptic scenario that I'm presenting. It's a slow erosion of something that was very good and is very, and is very important. And how exactly, in negative terms, it will have a severe impact, I'm not trying to postulate an argument about that. The world isn't going to collapse tomorrow because Doha wasn't completed. But anybody in the trade field knows that it has caused an erosion in terms of the acceptability and belief in the multilateral system, which is dangerous. That's as much as I can say. I think the argument about cyclicality, even though there has been 
uh, it's been in existence for such a short period that the WTO itself has not yet demonstrated this. I think that there, there may be a cyclicality in this. There may be a recognition by somebody in authority someday that something has to be done about it. And there, there were people in the last two years. I was asked to co-chair a group uh, which those of you who study trade may know we came in with a report for uh, Cameron, David Cameron and Mrs. Merkel which they both launched in uh, Jagdish Megwati and I were chairing it in, in Davos on how to finish the, the Uruguay round, uh, the Doha round and uh, what needed to be done and so on. And they were really trying. Uh, they actually launched the report, they, they made the right statements, they'd insisted that the G20 time after time at meetings underlined, and of course everybody as usual signs up to this rhetoric about Oh, it's vital that we conclude this round and everything else. Um, so they, there are people who are aware of this and who are trying. And maybe their voice will be heard someday. Maybe the next administration will have a more proactive involvement. I don't know. But at the moment, it's difficult to be optimistic. Okay, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
can be restructured, as you mentioned, uh, by, by creating more plurilateral organizations, uh, more plurilateral agreements that can actually deal with the concerns of creating these supply chains, uh, that it too could, uh, could enjoy a, a revitalization. So I just wanted to offer some, some words of hope, but um, above all, first to thank Rene Havakamp, who is responsible for um, bringing us these fantastic speakers from Europe, uh, and then to yourself for uh, giving us a, an excellent presentation. Thank you very much.